Good evening. So, welcome to the Geology Lecture Hall in uh, the Museum of Natural History. Um, I'll be introducing tonight's speakers, but uh, let me, uh, I'm delighted but not surprised to see how many people have showed up. Um, I want uh, to begin by acknowledging the Harvard Museum of Natural History for sponsoring this event in coordination with the Microbial Science Initiative. Uh, we're here to celebrate uh, a number of things around the two speakers. Uh, the first is their book, which I think we'll hear a little about soon. Uh, and the second is a, uh, an exhibit on the wonders of the microbial world. And uh, we'll, after we're finished here, we'll adjourn there for reception and uh, book signing and further discussion. If some of us seem a little more nervous than usual, that's because this is being live streamed around the world on Facebook. Uh, so uh, there will be all kinds of people who can't understand a word that I'm saying, but can appreciate uh, the pictures. Um, the, um, uh, I came here uh, 15 years ago. And uh, as you might imagine, uh, at a place like this, there were lots of people telling me what I should do. And the best advice I got was from a friend uh, named uh, Chris Walsh. And he said, do you know uh, this guy, Roberto Calter, in the micro department? I said, no, no, actually I don't. He said, I better introduce you. And as I said, that was 15 years ago. Roberto was also already a fixture here. He had been here 20 years already. And, uh, and since then, we've had a wonderful uh, series of scientific explorations and uh, a growing friendship and travels together. Uh, Roberto uh, was born in Guatemala. Most of his education uh, from high school on was in this country. Uh, first at Carnegie Mellon, then at UCSD, where he got his PhD, and uh, then at Stanford. And since then, uh, he's been here at uh, Harvard Medical School in the Department of Microbiology. Uh, he's done outstanding research. Uh, I won't uh, say much about that, except to uh, note that he's won a number of prizes and served as president of the American Society of Microbiology. Um, what I really would like to talk about is sort of Roberto's uh, singular identity, uh, both uh, at Harvard in the medical school, at, at Harvard in the larger university, and, uh, and around the world. Uh, in the medical school, uh, he's unique because almost every other microbiologist at the medical school is trying to kill microbes. <laughs> Roberto is trying to celebrate them and all their diversity and the contributions that they make to the planet. And uh, he also has played an extraordinary role in education. Uh, not only has he taught uh, all kinds of graduate courses in microbiology, uh, he started the Microbial Science Initiative to bring a like-minded community together. Um, he uh, taught a freshman seminar for many years, got me interested in teaching a freshman seminar. And uh, he uh, just won't quit. He goes all around the world uh, giving workshops, giving educational lectures, talking to young people. Uh, one of his uh, most recent projects, one still being worked on to show how selfless he can be, uh, is on microbes and food. And for that, he's had to travel to wineries. He's had to travel to uh, uh, artisanal cheese shops. He's had to travel to chocolate plantations and chocolatiers. Uh, he's tra uh, traveled to breweries, and I've never heard a word of complaint. And so, um, so that's just one small example. So, uh, so that's uh, Roberto, one of the people we'll hear about from tonight. His, um, his partner uh, this evening, and in many enterprises, is Scott Chmielewski. Uh, uh, Scott is a postdoctoral fellow in Roberto's lab. Uh, as an undergraduate, he studied microbiology and English. 
Uh, then he got his PhD in microbiology, and then a few years ago uh, came here <clears throat> to work in Roberto's lab. Uh, Roberto's lab, as you might imagine, uh, is a rather eclectic place, um, and Scott is unusual even uh, in that environment. Uh, he came, I think, because uh, Roberto uh, is interested in studying uh, well, Roberto, let me start over again. Roberto himself is a very gregarious guy, and so he, he doesn't like to have pictures of just a single bacterial cell. He likes to have lots of cells and organized structures. He likes to have cells of different kinds. He has, likes to have cells of very different things. And um, those can make for some striking images, and uh, Scott has, um, uh, has become an accomplished photographer. It's not easy to take pictures of things as small as what we're hearing about. There are a number of different techniques uh, involved, and Scott uh, has mastered all of them. And together, they've made a remarkable team. Uh, Roberto, because he can give such an evocative talk or uh, write so glowingly about microbes and the things they do, and Scott, because not so much for his technical skills, but for his aesthetic sense, uh, has made images uh, to match uh, the words. And uh, the images are, are really remarkable. Uh, I, I can't get enough of looking at them. And in some sense, they're very simple. One of my favorite early Scott images is on the journal, cover of the journal of bacteriology, which probably not everyone here is familiar with. But this particular cover is called Slime Mold Eating Bacteria. And the title says it all. That's what it is. It's a slime mold eating bacteria. But it really, and it, it's a still picture, obviously, but it's really striking in its composition and the way you get a sense of how these bacteria are being devoured. Uh, anyway, those are the two people you'll be hearing from. As I understand it, the format is probably closest to a tag team wrestling match, where one talks, and then the other, and then the first one again. So, Roberto? Thank you. Th thank you, John. Wonderful, wonderful introduction. I'm, I'm touched. And I should say, this is extremely exciting. I'm very happy to see all of you here. John and Andrea and Mitch, as you all know how excited I am and how important I uh, think this is, because I went out and ironed my, <laughs> my linen guayabera. And they know because they bought it, we bought it all together. So uh, this is very important for me. When I put this on, it's serious. Uh, so I thank you all for coming. And uh, tonight is very special. We're here to celebrate the book, as John has said. And the talk uh, has, is going to be a mano a mano, uh, and, and uh, we'll be going back and forth. And, and I already will now dim the lights because I believe the images are so beautiful. And so hopefully, uh, Diana warned me that this is soporific. I, I think it's OK uh, because I don't think you guys will fall asleep, at least I, <laughs> at least I hope. The wonders of the microbial world. So, Speaking about wonders, I hope you have been wondering about this image, because I find it so beautiful, and I'll come back to it. But you know, one of the things that scientists must do as part of their profession is we must communicate science, and we must do it in a way that is effective. And from my own personal perspective, an image is such a powerful way to open up that communication. And the image is beautiful, and that beauty can inspire or evoke in the viewer a curiosity. And out of that will arise questions that if I can then begin to answer or point in the direction towards an answer, then I think that gain of knowledge that the viewer will get is much more meaningful. So if I can talk about an image that I am passionate about, then I can hopefully make that a little bit contagious. Take, for example, an image that is particularly dear to me, that of my granddaughter. <laughs> so this is Amelia, Amelia and her wonderful smile. And so I'm passionate about Amelia, and 
very easily, just from seeing the reaction of you, you, you immediately connect with that image. And now we can begin because immediately you want to know, oh, what's her name? And wh when did she do this? When did she do that? And, da, 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 and does she look more like your son? Or et cetera, et cetera. So images have a powerful way of making that connection possible that will then begin to be able to ask questions, answer questions. This next image is fascinating to me. And I wonder how many of you have seen it. So <clears throat> it is a. It is a, it's a beautiful image, it's awe-inspiring, because I can tell you about it and I can share some of the knowledge that I find amazing that we as humans have been able to accomplish this, this amount of knowledge. So this is known the extreme deep field. It's a very, very well-known image that the Hubble took after a 20-day exposure. And it goes, it's been focused, the Hubble, Hubble on one of the darkest part of the sky. It's an area very small, maybe covers the amount that covers the, the moon. Uh, so it's not a huge part of the universe. But in it are some of the most distant galaxies. In this image, there are some 6,500 galaxies. Just imagine that. What means 6,500? And the dimmest reds, the reds are the ones that are traveling away from Earth. The blues are the ones that are coming towards Earth. And the dimmest reds are 13 billion light years away. Now, we cannot imagine <laughs> what is a billion. We cannot imagine what's a light year. Now, what is 13 billion light years? Now, this kind of image, once I tell you what it is, will definitely inspire a certain amount of awe and curiosity. And naturally, you will ask questions like, who am I? What's all this existence about? I, I, what is going on? Who, what is this Earth? So, it's this kind of images that I think are so powerful and make science communication a wonderful thing. But you know, I have a feeling that not all astronomers throughout the history have been able to communicate that kind of enthusiasm to a crowd. And why do I say that? Because the wonderful poet of the 19th century, Walt Whitman, said something quite interesting in one of his poems that is collected in Leaves of Grass, a poem that is known as When I Heard the Learned Astronomer. When I heard the learned astronomer, when the proofs, the figures were ranged in columns before me, when I was shown the charts and the diagrams to add, divide, and measure them, when I, sitting, heard the astronomer, where he lectured with much applause in the lecture room, how soon unaccountable I became tired and sick. Till rising and gliding out, I wandered off by myself in the mystical, moist night air, and from time to time looked up in perfect silence at the stars. Now, what is it about some scientists that when you hear them, how soon unaccountable I become tired and sick? <laughs> and it's our duty to communicate. And there's something that scientists need to learn that there is a way to communicate, and there's a way to communicate by having images that evoke in the viewer particular feelings, emotions. Because if I show you another image of the stars, I think it will evoke something in you. So very few people here will not recognize Van Gogh's Starry Night. Painted around the same time that that poem was written, and it gives you a very different sense of looking up in the silence at the stars. And once you see that, I can tell you that this was painted from his room in the asylum that he had tucked, taken his ear off and he had self, uh, walked himself into the asylum. I can tell you lots of wonderful stories that we learn a lot about Van Gogh. So I think that what we hope to do as scientists is to be able to confer some of that enthusiasm, that passion that we have for what we do in ways that will evoke questions because of the beauty that you see. And that, for example, for a long, long time, I've wanted to be able to stand in a uh, podium like this and tell you stories, or to actually have a book that says, look at this image, and now I can tell you a story. For example, I can tell you how much I love a particular bacterium that looks like this. And I, not surprisingly, we call these formations that bacteria make, the Van Gogh bundles. 
And people like it. People when you say, and why do you call them that? Because it reminds us of Starry Night. Uh, of course, this, I, to, to, uh, to make sure that my colleagues are very sure this is artificially colored, but they have a significance. The blue cells are making one particular compound that is now helping the yellow cells to move, which are now bundled so that they can use their force, the physical force of their growth, to move, to gain territory. So we learn a lot about these things. And so I wanted to tell these stories because I want you to ask me, and why are the yellow ones yellow? Because I painted it that way. Why are they long? Because they haven't divided, et cetera, et cetera. So there's lots of stories I can go on. Why are you interested in that? It can go on and on. So let me go now to another story that I would have liked to have told you for many, many years. And that's the story of this image that you saw at the beginning. You saw this image. And it said, wonders of the microbial world. And I asked you to wonder about them. And I wondered if you wondered. <laughs> but here they are. This, this, I just look at this. I want to look at it from your perspective. From your perspective. I, I think it's beautiful. You know, you see these little droplets. And I can take these droplets, and I can begin to tell you about such subjects as surface tension of water. I can begin to tell you, because they make this wonderful, wonderful round droplets. I can begin to tell you about the physics of a hydrophobic surface that is now allowing these things to form. Because the fungi that these are growing on make hydrophobic surfaces so that they can raise aerial structures. And you may wonder, why are they doing this? And I can tell you, well, you know what's fantastic about these microbes that they're making these beads? They're also releasing incredible number of molecules. And these molecules are such things as antibiotics. Wow. And of course, you know what an antibiotic is. We can converse. Why does a microbe make an antibiotic? And I can tell you honestly, we don't really know. The ecological role of these compounds, we don't know. Except I would like to tell you a little story about a place where we have learned maybe how these are functioning. And I do this in honor of John Clardy, because John Clardy has been quite involved in this story. And so it turns out that to tell you this story, I have to tell you another story in another beautiful picture, which is the story of the leaf-cutting ants. I have, how many of you have walked in a forest sometime and seen a trail of ants with the little pieces of leaves that are carrying, right? It is a, this is a wonderful sight. And you figure, why on earth are they doing this? Well, in the tropics, these little leaf-cutting ants are responsible for a huge percentage of the turnover of the leaves. It, it, it is a major activity. And they take their leaf cuttings down into their nest. And so for a long time, people thought maybe that's what they ate. But already over 150 years ago, people began to recognize that, no, they don't eat these things. They actually take them down, they chop it up, because they use it to feed their fungal garden. What does that mean? These ants are great farmers. So what they do is they chop the little leaves, and they feed it so that they can grow a fungus, which then they go ahead and eat. So they're great mushrooms eater, mushroom eaters. They love their mushrooms. And they're fantastic because they keep their fungal garden clean. Lots of fungi out there, but they only grow this one. And so for a long time, it wasn't clear why it was that this was able to make this. They, they preen themselves. They're very clean. But for a long time, people did not know why it was, how it was that they kept the fungal garden so clean. It turns out that what was thought to be waxy surface on top of the ants turned out to be bacteria. Bacteria that are symbiotic, mutualistic symbionts of the ants that make antifungal compounds that selectively kill pathogenic fungi that might infect the garden, but don't kill the fungi that are the garden. So here, it appears to be an adaptive situation where the ants <laughs> are providing a home for the little bacteria, and in return, the bacteria provide these compounds that we saw in those little beads in the plate in the laboratory. A wonderful place the antibiotics are, uh, are being able to be used. But the story doesn't end there. And I can tell you more stories. I can tell you that these ants, they have big, big jaws, and they bite. Uh, and so it turns out I can tell you a story of Ellie Williams, a wonderful botanist and anthropologist who was in the Peruvian Amazon in 1920s. And he discovered, he discovered that after the warriors, the natives would have wars, and they'd come home with big bruises and big cuts. Then the medicine woman would take a jar full of these ants and would 
take the ant and allow the ant to grab both sides of the wound and pinch it so that the wound would seal. And surprisingly, the wounds would never get infected. And now we can surmise, speculate, that these antimicrobial compounds that the ants make, carry because the bacteria make it, might be the reason why these wounds would never get infected. So you see, for a long, long time, I have wanted to tell you these stories, <laughs> to tell the whole world these stories. I wanted to have lots of pictures, and I wanted to have lots of text that told the stories to explain the pictures in a beautiful way. But like so many dreams, they sit up here, and they don't happen. And so they don't happen until I was so fortunate as to May of 2014, a little bit over three years ago, I received an email from Scott Shimileski. And I have no, no idea why I was so fortunate, but it happened. I got an email, and it said, Dr. Coulter, he was very formal. He said, Dr. Coulter, I like your work. I'd like to work with you as a postdoc. And I'm also a photographer, et cetera, but I, I'm interested in your biofilm work. And I, I think I answered within a few minutes, uh, Scott, come and let's talk uh, about what might happen. I said, Scott, with your talents, we could do something. And I'm thinking, hey, eventually we could write this book. And so, <laughs> but I think also maybe in a museum exhibit, things like that. And so within two months, <laughs> Scott had written a whole proposal about how we'd have a museum exhibit, how we'd have a book. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. I remember telling him, "Come on, take take it easy, Scott. You know, maybe after two or three years, we're going to have a proposal for a book." And I said, no. "I said, okay, fine." He, I, but anyways, interview. He came and interviewed. He wowed everybody in the in the laboratory. I said, "Scott, I offer you space in my lab to start in the middle of May 15, uh, May 2015, and uh, we'll see where we take these projects, the biofilms." The, museum exhibits, and maybe the book proposal. So he came, he arrived. I was thinking, maybe a miracle will happen. Maybe something will happen. And the miracle came by way of an email, actually a letter, that I got it around the time that Scott was due to start in May of 2015, that uh, Janice O'Dead, who was sitting there and was uh, the new science editor, life sciences editor at the Harvard University Press. I immediately, and she said, do you Dr. Coulter, do you have any idea for a textbook? Do I have an idea for a textbook? So <laughs> I, I went to her office and said, I propose this. Scott hasn't even arrived in the lab. I said, I think I have the right project for us. But we let it go. Scott arrived in the lab. We started doing lots of work. And by November, we had a proposal for a book. We sat with Janice. And by February, we had signed a contract. February of 2016, we had signed a contract for a book. And all the credit should go to Scott. By October was the deadline, and November, not even 30 days late, <laughs> we handed the manuscript. It was sent out to review. It came back with good reviews. We developed another chapter. And by February of this year, we went into production. It was a lovely experience to set the, the uh, uh, images in the right places on the pages. It was wonderful. I must say, when people ask me, how long have you been working on this? Well, really, working. <laughs> I don't know what that means. I've been thinking about it for a long time. Scott worked on it remarkably hard for a year. I must say, it was, it was a it was really, really wonderful experience. It is, uh, that is the reason we are here to celebrate, and so, this book called Life at the Edge of Sight, and you are welcome to peruse it. There's copies that we, we can see. It's what we want to tell you, what we'll be telling you about. I've been telling you already some of the stories that are in it. And the fun part, I must say, started around February when we signed the contract. We had made a proposal, but we didn't really know what the book was going to be about. So we had said, this is what we're going to write. But now we had to get down to the nitty gritty. And it was a lot of fun. I must say, it was one of the most fun experiences I've had. We started dreaming. And we said, why don't we start from looking out in space? And then we thought, well, let's go a little history. And it was fun. And part of the project was that we needed the images. And the images needed travel. And while I was visiting the breweries and the wineries, Poor Scott, he had to go to Holland and Greece and England and all of the national parks that he could get a hold of. And so we sent him off 
looking up at the stars. And so with that said, I want to have Scott come up and tell us a little bit about what he did. Thanks a lot, Roberto, for the introduction. And thanks, everybody here, for coming out tonight. I want to start out by arguing with you a little bit, though, and that is that I think you actually deserve most of the credit for this book. But we can, uh, we can, we can argue that later. Um, so here we are on uh, the first picture of the book, which is the cover of the book. So here we're zooming in on the cover of the book. And I don't know if anybody has any guesses as to where this is. But this is Yellowstone National Park in Wyoming. And so this person over here on the right is standing on a wooden boardwalk. That's my brother, Andrew. And we had this beautiful experience this night at Grand Prismatic Spring. This is the largest hot spring in North America. And Andrew here has his headlamp on, and he's shining his light into the distance. And it's a completely otherworldly place on Earth. You can see there's actually a shooting star coming here through the sky. You can see these colorful streaks radiating out across uh, the landscape and hazy blue steam clouds, bubbling sounds coming from all directions, a completely surreal place. And all of this with the galaxy above us and all of the wonder of the sky. The orange color you see at the bottom is actually produced by microbes. So these are microbial mats that cover the entire landscape. And it's a place where microbes become visible to the naked eye. So telling you about our journey, my brother and I, how we went to Yellowstone, makes me want to tell you a story of how we got there. And what I mean by how we got there is not how we actually went on the plane out to Wyoming, but how did we all get here? How did we get to Yellowstone? How did we all in this room come to be where we are today? And it reminds me of this great quote from a local uh, poet, Louise Bogan, who was born in 1897 in Maine. And the quote is, the initial mystery that attends any journey is how did the traveler reach a starting point in the first place? So what I want to tell you now is the story of the origin of life in a nutshell. And there's lots of details that are going to be worked out for a long time with respect to the chemistry involved. But we'll just do a quick, quick little run through of some of what we know about the origin of life. And it actually doesn't start with anything that's alive. If we want to talk about the origin of life, we have to begin with a supernova. So here is a supernova called SN1987A. Uh, it's called 1987A because the light from this supernova first reached Earth in 1987. And this is where uh, a lot of the heavier elements that make up the human body and make up all of life come from. They're created in a star. And then as that star dies and explodes, it sends that matter out across the universe. Some of those heavier elements end up in places like this. This is a, a nebula called the Carina Nebula. And these are interstellar clouds of dust and, and uh, matter. And these are the factories, the birthplaces of stars. These are where stars are born and where stars die. After you have a nebula, you have uh, uh, the creation of a star, and then you have the formation of planets around that star. So here you can imagine this is a star that's recently been formed in a nebula. And this here is called the protoplanetary disk. So here you have the newly formed star with initially all of this uh, dust and other materials spread around the star. And over time, they coalesce, they knock into each other. And from this celestial violence, planets are formed. And so this is how all planets are formed, including Earth. So now that we have Earth, the Earth that we had at that point was nothing like the Earth that we know now. It was probably closer to what we imagine as hell, in fact. This was the Hadean Eon, and the Earth was hot. It was molten. It was so hot, in fact, that it was above the melting point of iron. And during this phase, which was called the iron catastrophe, the heavier elements uh, iron and nickel sank to the core of the Earth, and this is how we had the formation of the core. This was a purely physical ph uh, phenomenon that happened, but it triggered one of the most important events in the origin of life, and that was the production of a magnetosphere around Earth. 
This magnetosphere is driven by the core of the Earth as convection currents run through uh, the outer shell of the core. And what the magnetosphere does is it protects Earth from solar wind that's constantly bombarding the planet. And if it wasn't for this magnetosphere, life could have never arisen on Earth as we know it, because one thing that the solar wind does is it strips off the atmosphere of planets. So without this little cozy protective bubble, the magnetosphere around Earth, we could have never produced the atmosphere that the biosphere, uh, so much of it exists within. And all of this high energy radiation would have damaged life. So now we have a magnetosphere, and these are really abstract concepts. We can't see the magnetosphere directly, but we can visualize it in other ways. And I want to just share quickly that we can actually listen in on the magnetosphere. So recently, there's been a couple probes from NASA out circulating around the planet. And they've been able to take collisions, the turbulence created by the interaction between solar wind and the magnetosphere, and shift these changes in frequencies into the audible range so that we can hear it. So this is what the magnetosphere sounds like as it's protecting life on Earth. We can all just take a quick listen. It's remarkable to me how this sound sounds like spring peepers or whales in the ocean and how patterns in nature repeat themselves. So now we have Earth, now we have a magnetosphere, we have a core. And what happens is magma at the, from the, that seeps up through the mantle creates hot spots on the surface, near the surface. And so here we see the magma is heating some groundwater, producing thermal features on the surface of Earth, like hot springs. And so these thermal features were very common on the early planet. This is what one of these thermal features might have looked like back then. This is from Yellowstone. And this is the shore of Yellowstone Lake. And you can see here this little tiny hot spring and the bubbling sounds that are coming out of it. When you stand next to one of these thermal features, it actually, you can feel the ground pulsating at, at, next to some of the bigger ones. And because this all comes back from the heat of the, of the planet in the core, it's really a way of sensing this enduring heartbeat of Earth. So here's another thermal feature. This is a uh, geyser. And this is really, could be one of the next steps in the origin of life. So we know that geysers, uh, down on the inner wall inside geysers, you can have the production of fatty acids. And that's one of the very most important uh, chemicals when it comes to the origin of life. You need to have fatty acids to create a uh, compartment, a cell, to separate the cell from its environment. So you can imagine that these fatty acids are being created on, on the inner walls of the geysers, and then they're ejected out from the geyser and floating on little particles of steam and water. They might land and settle into a hot spring. And that's really important because in the hot spring, these chemicals can uh, exist at higher concentrations and begin to interact with each other. So here's an animation of what fatty acids do when they're at high enough concentration under the right conditions all on their own. So this is a, a self-assembly process where the fatty acids are forming a vesicle eventually through several stages. And this is one of the most critical steps of the origin of life, getting that compartment to divide the cell from the environment. Meanwhile, all the chemistry was there for uh, the production of RNA molecules, which is believed to be the first heritable material. So as the vesicles were being formed, you also had the precursors of RNA forming, and initially they could copy right off of each other. So this is uh, non-enzymatic replication. RNA is actually uh, copying itself using another RNA molecule as a template. So you have the cells forming, or the protocells, the vesicles, and then the genetic material. Uh, RNA. They then combine, uh, they are, enter the cell, and you have uh, a natural life cycle for these protocells, which is actually driven by uh, physical conditions. So just by introducing some mechanical forces around these protocells, uh, you can, they'll divide on their own, and then you have two protocells, and eventually through many more steps, we get the first microbe, what we would call a microbe. 
So here are some microbes from Yellowstone. These pink cells are cyanobacteria. And from the first microbes on Earth, all life evolved from those first cells. So I like to say that microbes gave us life. At this time, microbes were actually anything but microscopic. So this was way before animals evolved. So microbes really reigned free on the planet. Uh, they had no grazers like snails and things like that to eat them. So they formed all these macroscopic structures. And these would be everywhere across the planet, on the shores of lakes and on the shores of seas. Now we have to go to special places like Yellowstone to find these, uh, where the conditions allow the thermophilic microbes to grow, but not the animals. And so these are some macroscopic structures formed by microbes in Yellowstone. Now we're back to the beginning of the journey here with my brother uh, sitting here next to Yellowstone. And what we're going to do now is come out of the darkness of Yellowstone and into the light. And this will start Roberto's next section. Because now that we've learned a little bit about the natural history of the planet, the question is, how did people come to learn about microbes? What's some of the history of uh, humans studying microbes? And so, Roberto, what do you see when you look at this cliff? Wonderful, wonderful. So, so, so Scott asked me, what do I see? I see microbes. But then again, no matter where I look, I see <laughs> microbes. But actually, as you will see, these are microbes. But what I also see, and for this I want to take you back a little bit over 300 years ago, 1660s, there's a tourist visiting. Yes, there was tourism back then. There's a tourist visiting the White Cliffs of Dover. He's a textile merchant from the Netherlands. But he's an inquisitive and a curious guy. And he looks at these cliffs, and he penetrates them with his insightful observation. This is what he tells us of his observation. Out of curiosity, seeing the great chalk cliffs and chalky lands, it set me a thinking. And at the same time, I also tried to penetrate the parts of the chalk. At last, I observed that chalk consists of very small transparent particles. And these transparent particles lying one upon another is, methinks now, the reason why chalk is white. This is an observer goes looks at these cliffs in a very different way. And he goes back, gets on his boat, crosses the channel. <laughs> I, I'm always reminded that people from the rest of the world call it El Canal de la Mancha, or El Canal de la Manche. But for some reason, the English people call it the English Channel. But that's not part of the story. <laughs> he crosses the channel, and he goes back to his home in the small town of Delft, painted here by Vermeer around the same time as our tourist wanders back home. And he has this inquisitiveness. He wants to penetrate everything that he sees. And he goes to the channels that are characteristic of Delft. And there, he's investigating everything around. He looks at the grasses. He looks at the mosses. And he collects small samples. You get the feeling that I like droplets. That is the case. So he Imagine he collects a sample that from one of these mosses, and he has this wonderful capacity that nobody else in the planet has. He can grind lenses so fine that he can see through them and magnifies whatever he's looking at in a remarkable way to see things that nobody has seen before in scales that are unimaginable before this by the naked human eye. He puts this little droplet in this little instrument of his, <laughs> he listens to the neighbor playing the viola de gamba and he peers at this droplet of water and for the first time in human history he sees a universe of living things that are so small that the eye cannot see this is the moment where microbiology is born imagine yourselves seeing this for the first time Nobody's ever told you that such creatures exist.
Yes, you all know I am talking about Anthony van Leeuwenhoek. <coughs> Let's see if, if he appears. There. Born 1632, died 1723. That is four years. He was born four years before Harvard was founded, and he died at a nice age of 91. How I wish that I could stand here with hair like that. <laughs> someday, someday I'll be able to do that. Every microbiologist now knows this wonderful diagram that comes out of his observations, which I call the A, B, C, D, E, F, G of microbiology. And by 1683, he wrote, all of the people living in our United Netherlands are not as many as the living animals that I carry in my mouth this very day. <laughs> he recognized the remarkable abundance of microbes. They were everywhere he looked, he could see microbes. He called them animalcules because he had no better word for them. They were little animals, as you saw them there. Let's go back to the cliffs, and let's recognize just how right he was. See, these cliffs are remarkable because the cliffs are chalk, but they are the result of the sediments that have laid down in the bottom of the ocean, and they have laid down there through the millennia as small shelled alga, photosynthetic microscopic alga are living and dying all the time, shedding their small shells, and they fall into the sediment. Sediment is now hundreds of meters deep, and you can find this sediment across the entire ocean floor. And it goes from Newfoundland to England, and if you go now to land, it goes through England all the way through Europe. All of that is based on chalk, that is the sediment that was accumulated by this algae dying and shedding their shells through the millennia. That alone tells you that microbial activity has been going on on this planet for a long time. And today, today we can go back and reread the statement that he made about small particles lying on top of each other is what makes chalk white. We look with the most powerful mic electron microscopes and what we see is this remarkable image of the <coughs> shells of this photosynthetic algae preserved in this chalk. This has been going on for a long, long time, and what happened in the White Cliffs of Dover is wonderful, because for many millions of years, England, what we know currently as the island, was connected to the mainland, held a huge, huge lake, which is now the North Sea and the Channel, until sometime, some 300,000 years ago, in the first original Brexit, this whole thing <laughs> fell off, separated from the mainland, and revealed the White Cliffs of Dover, where you can see 100-meter-high cliffs, all made of chalk. It gives you a sense of what micros have been doing on this planet. And if we come out of this uh, uh, view of the White Cliffs of Dover and look at it from the sky, where we have here Ireland and England and the Channel, and this is the Atlantic Ocean, what you see is this remarkable feature of the algal blooms. These are microbes, these are microscopic organisms that bloom so large that they cover hundreds of thousands of square kilometers during a bloom. And what's essential about this is that in blooming, they are capturing CO2, making themselves some of these shells, which are calcium carbonate, and also making living matter, fixing the carbon, and thus allowing the whole planet to have a primary producer of food. They are. And this is just one of the many ways that the microbes have been shaping the planet for millions of years and continue to shape it today. So when you take your next breath, consider the fact that the oxygen that you are breathing is likely to have been produced by one of these microscopic algae on the ocean during one of these blooms. But I think Scott has stood up. I think he wants me off the stage, and he is right. Back from space. <laughs> well, we'll go back to space later, but uh, it's time to come back down to Earth and spin the globe a little bit and talk about some microbes, not out in the ocean, but a little bit closer to home. So now we're looking again at another satellite image, but this, if anybody recognizes it, 
is nearby at the border of New Hampshire and Maine. So we're looking at right here is actually Portsmouth. Many of you probably enjoy going to Portsmouth. And now we're going to zoom in up here on a forest in the town of Kittery Point, Maine, where the Coulter Lab has actually been going on a uh, yearly retreat for nearly 30 years now. So we're going to zoom in onto this patch of forest here uh, in Maine. We're going to go into the forest and look at the beautiful forest floor with these uh, diversity of plants and, and trees here. We're going to zoom further in and focus on the forest floor, and particularly the leaves that make up the forest floor, the leaf litter. If we plucked any one of those leaves out of the leaf litter, not only in Maine, but anywhere, it could be right outside the door, and look at it under a scanning electron microscope, uh, this is what we would see in this uh, micrograph. This is the leaf in the process of being broken down by microbes. You can see at the bottom where the leaf tissue has been degraded already, leaving behind only a, a kind of a skeleton of the vascular system uh, of the leaf. And we'll zoom in further down onto this little patch here, and we can see a closer look of the actual microbes that are degrading this leaf. So all of these long filaments are fungi, and there's all sorts of different microbes and bacteria living and growing off of this leaf. And as they do so, they're producing enzymes that break down the leaf. And slowly, over time, these leaves turn into uh, dirt, turn into soil. And it's the soil, really, that forms, of course, the foundation for the forest and uh, provides nutrients for the entire forest. So what we're looking at here in this one image is really one of the most major living forces of the forest, one of the processes that is driving the entire forest ecosystem, the microbial breakdown of leaves and other organic material. If we look at the leaf uh, and we want to talk about what do these microbes do when we take them into the laboratory from a place like the forest. So we take this leaf, we press it onto a agar growth medium, uh, now working in the lab, and what we see is after several days, we're left with the patterns and different pigments and colors produced by the microbes that were on that leaf. We give them a nice cozy place to grow where they have plenty of nutrients and they form colonies made of millions of cells. These colonies that we find on leaves or in the soil or anywhere have a remarkable diversity of structure and form and colors that match an artist's palette. These are naturally produced pigments uh, produced by microbes uh, that really, uh, any color you want to find, you can find in a microbial cell. Some of the microbes from the environment we've taken in and started to use them to make foods. This is a type of fungus called koji that's responsible for making sake and miso and soy sauce here growing on a, a kernel of rice in the lab. Originally uh, very closely related to uh, another fungal species found in the environment. And if we zoom in on just one of these little stalks that are called conidiophores and look at what's happening, this is the top of one of these stalks. And what they're doing is releasing spores out into the environment that drift off in the air and can then eventually give rise to new colonies. Some of these colonies have remarkable what we call architecture or really intricate uh, complexity to their structure. This is a species of bacteria called Pseudomonas aeruginosa that's also found just about everywhere in the environment. We can zoom in even closer on the colony to really get a sense of this structure. And these are really like cities of microbes. This is a type of colony called a biofilm. And here we are looking at millions of different cells now that are making up this colony. If we go into a tiny patch of one of these structures and look at what the cells look like, this is what they look like. Uh, packed tightly together and joined together, attached to each other by uh, these sticky extracellular matrix components. And we can watch how these biofilms develop as well, uh, instead of just looking at the snapshots. And we see now the formation of these ridges uh, over time. And this is actually a way for the bacteria to gain greater access to oxygen in the context of this colony. Uh, so you can imagine that by having all of this structure, you have much more surface area and many more bacteria that have access to oxygen. Now we're going back to the leaf where we started, and we're going to focus in on this one little microbe right here. And that microbe is the spore of this organism called 
Fiserum, which is a slime mold. This is what Fiserum does in the laboratory when you let it crawl across a plate. It's searching for food, and you can see this pulsing behavior. When we look now inside of what's happening here, growing now inside of the slime mold network, we're seeing this pulsing, which is called cytoplasmic streaming. And so this is what's uh, responsible for moving the slime mold around. The, every little vein of the slime mold is expanding and contracting and expanding and contracting. And this is how the slime mold communicates. It's actually a semi-intelligent organism that's capable of making decisions, uh, solving mazes, uh, and all sorts of challenges that you throw at the slime mold. Uh, and people are never surprised by what they can do. So you can see this back and forth rhythmic, uh, rhythmic cytoplasmic streaming inside the slime mold. This is what one of these networks looked like, looks like when it's finished. And what's remarkable when we look at this image uh, from above is that this all arose through a, a self-organized process. So this slime mold has found all of the food sources now, it actually likes to eat uh, oat flakes, so there was probably a big oat over here, oat flake here and here, and it found all of the food sources, and it did all of this, it created this entire network through a self-organized process. There was no uh, higher order organization driving this. And it looks a lot like the city of Boston from above. <laughs> and indeed, the very principles, the very core fundamentals behind these emergent properties are the same. So just the same, the city of Boston emerged over the past few hundred years uh, through this same self-organized process. It's, a, it's an emergent property of our human society here in Boston. And so really when we're looking at biology, we have to look at not only the microscopic, but also the macroscopic view in order to understand the phenomenon that we're seeing. And while we're thinking about the very big and the very small, uh, I'll bring us back to Roberto's first slide here showing the deep field from the Hubble telescope. To make the point that looking here at these 6,500 galaxies, there's so many galaxies, each one containing so many stars, so many planets, that really there must be life somewhere else in the universe. It's very mathematically likely. It's uh, an immense, immense size that we're looking at. Statement. This, as I told you before, is a very small segment of the known universe. And what Scott was mentioning, this connectivity that we see already in the slime mold, this connectivity that we see in the city of Boston, this connectivity is also seen in the universe. When people begin to look and model what is happening in our universe, in a big scale, how are these galaxies forming? How are they interacting with each other? They begin to make these remarkable simulations in which we see streams of galaxies behaving a lot <laughs> like the slime mold. And this is what the simulation is showing. It's remarkable. This is now a slightly bigger part. It's still not the whole universe, which we said was at least 13 billion light years away from here in all directions. But now is a section that has been simulated to contain billions of galaxies across maybe a few hundred thousand light years. This simulation took some 1.4 million hours of computer time. You know how quickly when you do a Google search is 0.1 second. Right, this is 1.4 million hours across many, many thousands of processors working day and night for a long time. And what is amazing to me about this is this fibrous interconnectivity of our universe. And so what I'd like to do to end today's lecture is to talk a little bit about this interconnectivity as you watch the video of this simulation. So reading, actually I tell you, I did a trick. I brought the book so that you know that I'm reading from the book, but because the print is small and I am old, I printed it on a piece of paper. So from the book. 
We are making beautiful maps of the largest and the smallest structures in the universe. We are learning how galaxies themselves interact to form galaxy clusters and how galaxy clusters interact to develop into a lattice of thread-like filaments made of dark matter. It's called the cosmic web. Galaxies form among filaments and cluster at the nodes in the web where filaments join. Just as we could never see a virus by looking at individual atoms, just as we could not see a biofilm by looking at individual bacterial cells, we could never see the cosmic web by looking at individual stars or galaxies. Simultaneously, we are exposing how analogous networks of neurons develop in the brain. And we have found at the apex of many scientific disciplines that on Earth, everything depends on everything else. How could we ever take a picture of that complete interdependency? What would the image look like if we captured in one large scale view, like the cosmic web, is for the universe the sum of all biological activity across the web of life? All of the connections between organisms and ecosystems, humanity, the forest, the living ocean of microbes, the living soil, and the other ways that those ecosystems impact global patterns. How would that look? Well, we already have that picture. It's Earth. Thank you very much. So, if I could keep the lights down for just a little bit longer. Yeah. Just a little bit, because we come up with this wonderful, I think you say Scott. <laughs> I said, Scott, why, what do we do about credits? So, here they are. How do we do this blackboard stage? Important, Gleb, Nick, Lori, Jorge, Einat. This is the Coulter Lab members that inspired us throughout this whole project. project. Hera, I don't know if Hera is here, or Jordi. I invited him, he's in Amsterdam, in Zurich, sorry, so he couldn't come. And now gratitude to the Center for Nanoscale, the Micropia Museum, National Park Service, NASA. Of course, all of those images from space, Scott didn't travel there himself, <laughs> <laughs> had to be NASA. So once again, wonderful that you all came. We are happy to answer questions. Thank you very much. <laughs>